Hello, greetings. Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Happy to be here with you. I have an interesting theme here that I would like to share with you. I don't think that in all the history of UFOs or UFO research that any researcher that I can think of, or really any anyone that I can think of, has tried to answer these two questions or even ask them. Uh, first question is, how much UFO activity is going on in our world? And the second question is, how many craft are responsible for this activity? In reviewing all the literature on UFOs that I am aware of, I have never seen either of these questions seriously addressed. Now, if I'm wrong, I would be grateful for uh, someone who wants to offer an answer, uh, whether in the chat box or in the comments section. Uh, I'd love to see it. I'd be interested in uh, if anyone else has done this type of work, but I am thinking this hasn't really been addressed. And when you think about it, for something this important, you'd think that we would really want to get a handle on such a basic fact as this. Like, what is the quantity of this operation? How big is this operation? It's such a fundamental, it's such a basic thing to know. And we here in our society, we're we're just not, we're just not there. We don't really have a grasp of this, in my view, at all. And we haven't really been asking it. I, I wonder if anyone's even thought to ask it. It has been 80 years of this phenomenon in the modern world. Well, 75, if you want to start from 1947, but honestly, this didn't start then, but whatever. It's been a long time. We have been um, dealing with this phenomenon. We've been thinking about this phenomenon for a very long time. And You'd think for something this basic, you'd want to get a sense of what is the scale of operation. So I've got um, I've got some slides I'm going to share with you. I'm going to walk you through my process for uh, trying to deal with this this uh, these two questions. And I will just say, like right off the bat, that everything that I'm about to suggest here is entirely speculative. There is no way that I can pretend uh, that I'm going to be able to answer any of these things definitively. So I, at the end of it, I will offer some um, estimates on potential amount of uh, UFO trips and activity per year, and how many craft might be responsible for that. But I need to emphasize to you here uh, th that at any uh, step of all the variables that we're gonna be looking at, I could be wildly wrong on any one of them or any number of them. So I would encourage you, if you have uh, an inclination to do this, to go through uh, whether the methodology that I have here or come up with your own to try to determine this. I think it would be a very good thing for a number of us to do. I have a feeling that, uh, you know, what I will offer, I, it can't all be right. A lot of it's going to probably be wrong. So that said, let me just jump in. I've got some um, images and slides here and graphs and whatever to show you. So how many UFOs are there really? Uh, this, by the way, is something that I did for my website a few weeks ago, richardolanmembers.com. I put together a version of this, uh, I think two or three weeks ago, and I think it, it got a, a nice response. I think a lot of people thought, yes, let's let's follow up on this. And that's one reason I'm doing this here for a broader audience on YouTube. So let me dig in here. So the first thing that we want to, that I feel I'd like to start with is statistics and data from the National UFO Reporting Center. And the reason that I think it's important is because it's a public database. Anybody can access the reports that are collected there. That's a site run by Peter Davenport. It's called New Fork for, it's the National UFO Reporting Center.com or .org, I think, sorry. And um, he just takes in what we call raw reports every year. So if you have what you think is a UFO sighting, you can, submit it to his website and he'll put it right up there. Uh, if it's a particularly interesting sighting, in his opinion, he may uh, communicate with you, whether by email or phone, and he will mention such things in the uh, reports on the website. So very interesting. So on a yearly basis, New Fork will get anywhere from uh, 3,500 UFO reports to over 7,000. I have a uh, graph here for the last five years not including 2022. Um, 2022 is on track 
uh, for maybe up to 4,000 reports this year. You can see there's been a little bit of a variation over the last few years. It had been a slow, steady growth up, more or less up to around 2017. Then we saw a drop in 2018. I still really don't know why, frankly. Uh, recovered in 2019 and 2020, where it was nearly at 8,000 reports for that year. Uh, maybe because people were not out at work. People were, I don't know, had nothing else to do during the coronavirus epidemic. They're looking up at the sky. I'm not really sure. Uh, it dropped in 2021 down below 4,000. And for 2022, at least based on the first half of the year, he's roughly the same as 2021, a little higher so far. But, you know, there's there's a lot going on there. And um, it's not just the National UFO Reporting Center that accepts UFO reports, of course. In North America, you have a lot of reports coming in from MUFON. Uh, MUFON's numbers are very similar to what you get at New Fork, roughly speaking. So you get anywhere from three to four to 5,000, 6,000 reports in a given year. I don't know what their last couple of years are, but that is by and large their year in, year out total uh, with not a lot of overlap on the two of the sites. There is always going to be some but it's not a whole lot. There is there is some, um, maybe even as much as 10%. I think that's probably a high estimate, probably less than that. Uh, so when you estimate the total number of reports, I'm just going to talk about North America, really U.S. and Canada. Uh, and that is because MUFON and New Fork both primarily are getting reports from U.S. and Canada, by and large. There are a few that come in from other regions of the world but not too much. Let me get, I'll get to the rest of the world in a minute. Right now, let's focus on these two. So with New Fork and MUFON, we can say rough estimate, very rough estimate. You're talking maybe around 10,000 reports per year. Realistically, you have a range of, it could be as little as 7,000 per year for the two of them to as much as 14,000 per year, give or take a little bit here and there. So it's a bit of a range. Uh, if you add in Canadian reports, these are connect collected. There's a couple of Canadian sources. Uh, most prominently out of uh, the University of Manitoba, Chris Rutkowski, he gets one to 2,000 of these reports a year, which he publishes. Again, I'm not sure how much is definite overlap with the other two sources. Uh, no doubt there is some overlap. So we're, we're talking rough numbers here. But by and large, uh, I don't think it's outrageous to say that you have a realistic North American range of anywhere from 8,000 sightings per year uh, that are reported uh, to maybe as high as even 15,000 sightings in a given year. It's, it's a lot, right? Uh, now, of course, you're thinking what probably everyone else is thinking and what I'm thinking, which is how many of these sightings are genuine? How many are the real deal? These are raw reports. Uh, by and large, these do not get, let me just take this screen off here. By and large, these do not get uh, a genuine investigation. They are submitted I mean, even with MUFON, they've, they have investigators, they're out on the field, they do what they can. But let's face it, no one's paying these MUFON investigators. They do this on their own dime, their own time, their own energy. Uh, it's not easy. And th the fact is that there's, there's just so much quantity out there. It is very difficult to get every one of these cases or even a small minority of them investigated in a in a legit way, in a satisfying way. It's very difficult. MUFON, you, you got to hand it to them. You know, for all the uh, complaints that have been levied at MUFON over many years, uh, I've levied a few of them myself. But the fact is they are the only civilian-based organization that year in, year out has people out in the field investigating these reports. And that is very important. Uh, we really, you need that. We want reports that are strong, and the only way they're going to be strong is if they get a halfway decent investigation where you can have some confidence in them. And that's really what MUFON does. When they're on their game, they can do this very well. So, uh, but, but my point here is that very few of these reports that are submitted to New Fork uh, get a proper investigation. MUFON, I, I don't know. I mean, they, they do their best to investigate as many as possible. Um, so what is the actual percentage of true unknowns that, you know, what of all the UFO reports that are submitted? You know, you hear a lot of numbers being tossed out there. I've spoken to some uh, really, really rigorous, good UFO investigators who will say it's very low. Maybe one or two percent are actually really puzzling, really worthwhile. 
Uh, personally, when I get into the details, I feel that that's a bit stringent, and I think it's probably unrealistically uh, a little too a little too tough. Uh, there are other end of the spectrum analyses that'll go as high as twenty percent, or even more, even more than twenty percent for. Uh, you know, describing these sightings as truly unidentified and unexplainable. I, I tend to think that's a bit very too high as well. Um, so how do we how do we make our own assessment? Well, what I would say is, look, you're never going to know for sure. Really, I mean, you have to you talk to as many informed people as possible, and they're going to give you different answers. No one, in my view, really truly knows this definitively. But what I will give you is my take on this since, hey, I'm doing the talk here. Uh, I have I have a little rule of thumb, which I call the wow factor. <laughs> so it's really simple. When I'm going through reports uh, on the National UFO Reporting Center, which I very much like to do uh, fairly regularly, I'm on that side a lot. If If I'm reading a report and it makes me say wow or think wow, that's pretty good <laughs> if it makes me say, wow. So what in my estimation, when I'm looking at these, uh, I would say 10% is really not, it's not out, out of the question that one out of 10 reports on that website, go check this for yourself. Don't take my word for it. Read one out of 10 of the uh, reports, just take 10 at random. Uh, one of them is very possibly li likely to make you say, wow, I mean, that's that's pretty darn interesting. That seems legit. And if it's not one out of 10, I will more confidently say, at least this is from my uh, experience, one out of 20, absolutely, that's 5%, will almost always make me say, wow. Um, now, look, that's not the same as saying, oh, this is a genuine investigation and I have total confidence that that this is a legitimate report. It doesn't work like that. And we're not in that situation. And there, so you could say, well, we're going to dismiss those reports, but I think that's really unwise. It's a tremendous amount of data in these raw reports and a lot of information. There's a lot that we can learn from them, but we have to use our judgment. You've got to just be careful and realize, all right, they haven't all, they haven't almost mostly received a genuine investigation. So I'm just going on my best instinct by reading this. And that's sometimes all you can do. Now, some of the, these sightings do get investigated. Um, some of them be, are very thoroughly investigated, but by and large, most of them aren't. But so you can decide where you feel with all of that, but this is, I'm just giving you my take on it. So I, I'm willing to say one out of 20 sightings, whether in the MUFON database or the New Fork database is very likely to, to get my attention and make me think that seems like a real UFO. Uh, this is the uh, splash page of the National UFO Reporting Center. I'm just showing you here if you want to do this yourself. Uh, they recently did a reorg of how this site looks. I'm not in love with it, to be honest. I underlined here where it says data bank on top. When you go to New Fork, uh, I think it's newfork.org, uh, you go to data bank. And then when you're in there, you get a whole list of... Uh, well, he breaks it down by event, date, state, shape of UFO, and date posted. To me, the most useful one by far is uh, event date. And when you click that, you have uh, it takes you all the way through every month of every year, going back year after year after year. And you pick whichever month you want, and then you will end up with a list something like this. Uh, this is, uh, what do I have, August of 2020. I just kind of picked that at random. And you will see that here, all of the sightings are from the same day. They're all from August 30th, 2020. And um, I think he's got like 15 or more from that day alone, 15 or more sightings. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they're all legit UFOs. We'll get to that in a moment. But there's a lot there. And if you uh, click the uh, the link on the left there, you can read the full report, however short or long they happen to be. And I would encourage you to do that. It's um, There's a lot of really interesting information in there. A lot of these reports are uh, almost boring. <laughs> they're not They're not all fascinating. Uh, not everyone's a good reporter of these. That's just the reality of it. Not everyone gives all the information that you'd like to have in a report. Unfortunately, these are the breaks. But there are a number of, of pretty good ones in there. And they, uh, to me, they seem very much worth reviewing. I go through uh, many UFO reports every week. This is for research uh, that I'm just, it's ongoing for me, particularly the next volume 
of UFOs in the national security state. Uh, and I'm just going through a lot of sightings uh, for every year of the 21st century these days. So I'm in the new fork database a lot. Uh, but anyway, let me continue here. So when you, uh, so let's do some basic math. <laughs> uh, if, as I said earlier, like let's say you take roughly 10,000 UFO reports uh, with MUFON and New Fork and what, what you get in Canada, let's say 10,000, all right? And you take 5% of those. You take one out of 20 of those. If we really want to be tough and um, I think relatively rigorous, that'll give you about 500 good reports a year. And I, I bet uh, that that's probably, that's really the case. Like I'll bet on any given year, you're going to see 500 really very interesting, very good UFO reports. I think that's that's actually a bare minimum. Uh, that gives you a little more than one a day, 1.37 per day. And nearly all of those reports are for the United States and Canada, as I said. Uh, I don't know the percentage, but it's well over 95% of all the reports uh, on those two databases are for US and Canada. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe MUFON's got a little bit more uh, from international sources, but it's it, these are, by and large, these are American reports uh, and Canadian reports. So we'll say 10,000, 5% that gives you 500. We'll just go with that. Now, how many uh, of these, how many UFO sightings in general are reported? This is a, an important question. Um, uh, let, me, let me just uh, discuss this a little bit more here. So I remember uh, when uh, Stanton Friedman would be speaking at UFO conferences and he uh, very frequently, he did this a lot. He would ask members in the audience, you know, like 500 people out there, 400 people say, how many of you have seen a UFO? And up would go uh, a bunch of hands. It's a UFO conference. A lot of people have seen UFOs. No surprise there. So a bunch of hands go up. And then Stan would always say, how many of you ever reported this sighting? And invariably, nearly all the hands would go down. Like one or two would be up. Uh, definitely one out of 10 or less than one out of 10 uh, would be reported. And I myself did this frequently as well. Once I saw Stan doing it, I thought, you know, I'm going to do this as well. And uh, many, many times uh, I would ask the questions and it would be the same thing. So a bunch of hands would go up to say, yes, I saw this, but very few ever reported it. So that, that leaves you to conclude there's a lot more UFO sighting activity that is out there than is actually arrive, appearing in these reports. So, and we want to do this because we want to get a handle on how much UFO activity is actually going on in this world. Uh, even back in the 19, I think it was 1960s, uh, J. Allen Hynek, uh, the astronomer, of course, who was part of Project Blue Book, he estimated uh, one out of 10 or less uh, UFO sightings got reported to Project Blue Book or to the private groups that existed at the time. So I think this has been a pretty long-standing estimate. One out of 10, we'll say. And I think, I think one out of 10 is probably a little high anyway. Uh, but then, you know, there's something else that I was thinking of. If you have a really good UFO sighting, and that's kind of what I'm talking about here, like good UFO sightings, would you be more likely to report it than otherwise? And I'm inclined to think the answer to that is yes. Now, how much more likely? Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm taking a guess here, and I'm going to say maybe one out of four good sightings will be reported. Could be wrong. It could be one out of two. Maybe it's less, maybe it's one out of three one out, or one out of six. I don't know. Um, I'm inclined to think that a good UFO sighting is more likely to get a, uh, be reported than one that's, you know, not as exciting. I'm sure that's true. So we're just guessing. So let's say one out of four good UFO sightings are reported. So again, this is all provisional. You know, you plug in different numbers if you want, but if you've got 500 good North American sightings per year, multiply that by four, and you might have an estimate of how many good UFO sightings actually occur every year in North America. That would be about five, uh, actually five and a half a day. Now, look, I just want to emphasize again, uh, this is just one of several points along the way here where I could be dead wrong in my estimate. And I'm not pretending, 
that this is the final word. But, you know, if you're willing to suffer through this with me, let's just keep going. And I want to take you to my uh, my final uh, tallies here. So that's North America. What about the rest of the world? Now, you keep in mind that the United States and Canada comprise actually less than 5% of the total population of this globe of ours, of humanity. Um, the United States, uh, this is a, a pie chart of uh, world population. You got China and India leading the pack by far. The United States is in third place in terms of uh, total population. We have a 4.34% of the US, of the world population. Uh, Canada doesn't even figure on this list. It would be a very small sliver, uh, less than 1%, uh, I, it's much less than that. So the total with the US and Canada is under 5%. Let's just say 5% for the sake of uh, argument here. So that'd be one out of 20 uh, people in the world live in either the US or Canada, roughly speaking. So when we're talking about the rest of the world, now every other region of the world, and I'm not trying to, to dunk on any other nation or any other region, but the fact is they have what I would consider to be a terrible uh, reporting infrastructure for UFOs. It's just not good. This is uh, this is not a good situation worldwide. North America, for all of the flaws that we have in terms of UFO reporting in the US and Canada, at least we've got MUFON and at least we've got New Fork, where ordinary people, are able pretty easily to report their sightings, right? It's not that difficult. Uh, other parts of the world, there's there are many other excellent UFO organizations in other parts of the world. You go to South America, there's a large number of dedicated and excellent UFO researchers there. Ditto with the United Kingdom. Uh, ditto with uh, parts of Europe. It's a little skimpy in Europe, but there are there's definitely good UFO researchers and good UFO research in Europe. Uh, other regions of the world, you've got Japan, yes. China, yes. Russia, yes. Uh, parts of Africa, yes. And then other parts of Africa, not really, no. But there, there's no places in the world. Australia is another one. I don't want to forget them. Um, there are no other... Uh, easily accessible databases that I am aware of, particularly in non-English speaking regions. You know, if you're if you're in Australia, uh, you're just as likely to submit your report to New Fork and MUFON as you know any other place. I mean, it's not that difficult. The language there's no language barrier. Uh, but for other languages and regions, uh, there isn't that I'm aware of a really good overall database where people can just report their sightings uh, as for raw reports. And I've always considered that a, a real problem uh, because what we want it, on such a fundamental question as UFOs, at least you want to get a sense of the data. You want to get a sense of the scale and it's difficult for us. We know that there are sightings that go on all the time in other parts of the world uh, because they do sometimes get reported to some of the Western organizations, but by and large, it's a much lower amount. So anyway, there's a few assumptions that we could be making here. Um, we, we, I think we have to assume that people around the world are seeing these. Um, that the question is, are they seeing them in the same basic amounts vis-a-vis -vis the uh, percentage of the population? So, you know, the one assumption that I'm making here is that UFOs are evenly distributed around the world. Now, that's an assumption that could very well be wrong. Absolutely. But, you know, I'm going to make that assumption for the sake of argument here. Uh, it very well could be that there are more UFOs in the United States because perhaps the United States might have a technological infrastructure that is of interest to an alien uh, group that's lurking about. Maybe, but I, I doubt that the United States infrastructure is at this point, so uniquely situated that it should be getting all these all the attention. I seriously doubt that. So I'm going to assume that UFOs are more or less evenly distributed around the world. And if that is so, if we want to get a sense of what's going on in the rest of the world, well, that means we might want to multiply the North American total by 20, since if we're going to go by percentage of population. Again, I may be wrong, but you can come up with a better solution on this if you want to plug in your own numbers. If you multiply by 20, and again, this is another 
uh, you know, possible uh, pitfall here, but that gives you 40,000 good UFO sightings per year that, um, you know, that have occurred. Okay. So that would be more than 100 a day. And that's quite a bit. So th let me just recap so far. So this is my little equation here. So you have a rough estimate of 10,000 UFO reports in North America each year. If, if you take 5% of those for good uh, sightings, that gives you 500. North America, how many are reported uh, of good sightings? We're going to say 25% in this case. That gives you 2,000 good sightings in the U.S. Uh, and Canada. Multiply by 20 to give you the world, the rest of the world, that gives you 40,000 good sightings a year, or again, more than 100 per day. But let's keep going here because we're, we're just getting started. Um, we, you want to ask, and, and this is something that also never really gets asked, how many UFOs are never even noticed? How many never get, uh, not, forget how many get reported, how many are not even seen? This is a difficult question to answer because, well, how do you, how do you answer something from the absence of evidence? That's, that's not a good form of logical argumentation. Any logician is going to tell you that. But I think there are times when this is a fair uh, question to look into. And I think this is a very good instance of one where it is fair to look into. Uh, and the reason I did, this is another talk I did on my website just recently. I called it UFOs in Disguise uh, as a way to sort of deal with some of these issues. So one thing that you know when you start looking at UFO reports, like a lot of UFO reports, is how ephemeral and how fleeting most of the sightings are. And also you get a sense of how just how lucky the witness was even to see the UFO at all. Uh, these events, you know, they nearly always catch someone off guard. Uh, I, I don't know how many times, you know, I've read a report will someone will say, oh, it was two in the morning, I couldn't sleep, I go outside and I saw this, I almost couldn't see it, a dark black triangle hovering 300 feet over my neighborhood. You know, uh, only notice because someone decided they couldn't sleep and they go outside and they see this thing. Um, and there's so many other cases where someone's looking at a UFO and uh, it's either barely visible and they only saw just because they happened to be lucky to be looking in that direction um, and so on. So it was one of the things that I mentioned on my uh, on my site the other, like a week ago, UFOs really are, are very adept at disguising themselves. They do this all the time. Uh, there are definitely uh, a number of cases where you see them mimicking uh, light configurations of ordinary commercial aircraft. And I'm saying mimicking because I'm going to show you a couple of cases where they're They've got those light configurations, but then they're doing right angle turns. So, okay, I think we can figure that one out. Um, they definitely can engage in cloaking of various types, whether partial or full. Uh, they definitely can engage in what seem like shape shifting uh, operations. They can mimic other objects, whether balloons or clouds, and they can just disappear. So uh, let's let me talk now. Um, I've got a few cases. I'm I've been lately just researching the year two thousand nine. This is why I'm going to show you a couple of cases from 2009. I know it's 13 years ago, but honestly, they could have been picked from any year. Um, I'm on my website. One thing that I do is I I go through. Uh, I create usually uh, various mini documentaries on best UFO sightings of the year of the 21st century. So I'm up to 2009 on my website, which by the way was an amazing year of sightings. Um, which hardly got any attention whatsoever, but really phenomenal. So I'm just going to show you some of those sightings because I've just recently been looking at them and that's why you get to see it. So this is Westminster, Maryland. This one's October 3rd, 09. Uh, this person just says, while at Bowger's Farm Market uh, at 4.30 in the afternoon, so this is a daytime sighting, my wife asked me to photograph a very large hawk and he's looking at this, this kind of thing happens so frequently, of course, I'm sure. And many of you watching have said, oh, this happened to me. You take a picture and you don't notice until you're reviewing the images later that there's an anomaly in the in the sky. And that's what this guy caught. Um, it's very, very faint. And you might think, well, this is no big deal. But when you look at the enhancement, it's actually quite well defined. And you could say, well, that could be anything. But the question is, what is the anything it could be? Um, it's almost certainly not an insect. I don't think there's any chance of that. I think it's um, 
highly unlikely. Certainly, you see this so many times in so many photographs. It's I just can't see that insect is really going to be the explanation. There's something up there, and whatever this is, it's it's a very unusual shape. And this happens all the time. He gave the uh, specs of his camera, a 10.2 megapixel, which even today, that's pretty good. Uh, he had a really decent camera that he was using. This is a MUFON case here. Uh, here's another one. This I don't have a photograph here, but the witness, this is in Parkersburg, West Virginia, uh, in the evening, and the uh, witness stated an object blinking red and white lights was seen heading west, made a 90-degree turn to the north, then east, then south. Shape could not be made. It was too high up. So in other words, this is something that if it had simply gone in a normal, easy path, blinking red and white lights, you think, oh, well, that's just an ordinary commercial aircraft. How many times has that actually happened? Well, the only reason this guy noticed it is because it, it started moving in a highly unusual manner. Uh, here's another one uh, from Seattle. Uh, oh, yeah, this is a good one. So you have two friends. Uh, they're outside at, a, at an outdoor pub after work. It's a sunny day. Uh, the guy writing this in said, I had only two sips from my beer. <laughs> he wanted to make sure I tell everyone that he wasn't drunk said, when I looked up at a white triangular object to the north of uh, what he called the new building, I don't know what that was. Uh, so both of them observe it very uh, moving slowly and it goes behind the building that they're, that's in front of them. And then he says, it seemed to change shape and morph into a roundish oval shape, then back to a triangle and then roundish. And then he said, with a strange fuzzy filter surrounding the object, Two other patrons said, that's something you don't see every day in Seattle. Uh, after another 10 minutes, it moved. It started moving southwest and ascended in the air, he said, toward the Puget Sound. He said it was about the size of a compact car, and we observed it for 20 minutes. And I just want to mention this uh, glow or fuzziness that you will often uh, see in relation to UFO reports. Uh, sometimes they'll even describe things as a smoky haze that's around an object. And you know, I don't know if we have a definite answer for that, but one answer might be what's called the ionization effect of these objects, where uh, it's been theorized uh, by people like the late Paul Hill, former NASA scientist and others, that if you have an electrical field around the craft or, uh, yeah, electrical field, that that will interact with the atmosphere, which that's an ionization effect, and that will cause a kind of glow. And this is one reason it's been theorized why so many UFOs glow, particularly it's more noticeable at night than even in the daytime, but it can be seen in the daytime. Uh, and also the haze, uh, which this writer noticed, uh, it's been speculated that if you have contaminants in the atmosphere of any sort, that the ionization could cause a kind of smoky or hazy effect. And I'm not saying that's the definite cause here, but it's just something to consider. The writer of that report wondered if the haze was uh, itself an effect to help disguise the aircraft. Apparently, it made it a little more difficult to see. But the reason I'm bringing this case up is that this thing changed shape. It's it shape shifted, and you know, anytime a craft is able to do things like that, it's probably going to make it a little more difficult for us to notice. So let me move on to the next case here. Uh, this is another photograph, and this is another case where someone takes a photograph and doesn't see the object until review. This is a pretty big object. I'm going to zoom in on it. This is in Hawaii, and there you can see a bit of a close-up. The person writes, I was sitting on the Bonsai Pipeline Beach October 9th, taking pictures of the surfers and the waves. When I took a picture of the sun behind the palm tree, I did not did not notice the object. I only saw it once I loaded the picture onto the computer. Again, this is very, very uh, typical. You hear this a lot. Uh, the writer said there was no noise of, or of a helicopter or of a plane when I took the picture. And, you know, clearly this does not look like a helicopter or a plane. A lot of these images do look, uh, do look like birds when you really study them and people often don't notice. They don't think it's a bird. Like a lot of times it is, but I don't, think that this is a bird. Uh, I've seen a lot of images where it's clearly a bird, and this does not strike me in any way as such a thing. Uh, maybe it's an unusual balloon type object. I don't know. Um, this type of thing happens quite a bit. I, I just don't think it's a balloon. Um, 
the author, the writer said it was a strange metallic oval object with a triangular structure on top. I don't think it is. I think when you look at that, it just seems to be like a smoky effect on top, whatever that is. It doesn't really seem like it's triangular. But anyway, that's that sighting. So again, another one that was not noticed by the witness. So I have many, many more of those. I'm just, that's all that we can need to do here for now. So the question is, how many UFOs are never even noticed? These are easy to miss, I guess is my point in mentioning this to you. They're very easy. It's easy not to see a UFO. So what is it? Is it a factor of five? Is it a factor of 10? I, I personally think, I mean, it could be much more than a factor of 10, quite frankly, when you really sit and think about this. But again, it's difficult to make such an argument because this is an, an argument from absence of evidence. And it's it's a difficult uh, area for us to make an argument because again, we really, we just don't know, we can't know. Uh, I'm giving you my best guess here and I'm gonna just say a factor of 10 does not strike me as outrageous at all. It strikes me as entirely legitimate, as entirely possible. And to be quite honest about it, it could be much more than that. But let's just say 10. Now I'm going to take a very quick segue. We're going to talk about the commercial airline industry. And you'll see why in a moment. Um, when you look at uh, the airline statistics of the last couple of years, of course, um, airline flights really peaked in 2019. That was the year before the world turned upside down. So in uh, 2019, there were 38 million commercial airline flights that year. Unbelievable, right? So many. Uh, it dropped to less than half that in 2020. No surprise there, down to 16 million. And back uh, a little bit of a rebound to 22 million uh, in 2021. I don't have the numbers for this year, of course. Now, um, what's interesting, and I, I really tried checking these numbers several times because when I, I first came to this, I thought this, this can't be right, but it is right. There's roughly 28,000 commercial aircraft in the world today. It might be a little higher now. In, in 2019, 2020, it was around that number. Uh, and I thought, you got that many aircraft making this many flights per year? And the answer is yes, it appears to be. Each of these, every commercial airliner is making basically three to four flights a day. Uh, I looked at this in a number of ways, and apparently that is true. Uh, that's a Boy, that's a heavy workload, but that apparently is the case. They're doing a lot of work. So um, that said, and by the way, the number of people that they are transporting each year uh, is in the billions every year. So in 2019, it was four and a half billion people are estimated to have traveled. Now, a lot of those are overlaps. It's, you know, you have many cases where it's the same person uh, doing multiple flights, but four, four and a half billion human beings total were on these flights. And then it, it fell to under 2 billion the next year, and it, it, it's at 2.2 billion a year ago. But in each one of these, per flight, you're looking at a little more than 100 people per flight, uh, just in case you were wondering about that. Now, back to UFOs. So if, we're, if, if we take my earlier number of 40,000 good UFO sightings per year that, that are made, right? And you say, well, one, you know, the, the factor of, of UFOs that are not even seen is a factor of 10, right? So we'll just take our number, multiply by 10 to get a rough estimate. Now we're looking at 400,000 UFOs around the world per year. Now you're going to stop me right there and say, whoa, that's a lot. Uh, you, you're really going out on a limb here, Richard. And I will say, yes, uh, I am going out on a limb and I could easily be wrong. Again, this could totally be wrong. But I, I still believe it is worthwhile for us to be asking these questions and to be doing our best to coming up with some estimates here. And that's all that I'm trying to do. You may have a, a different criteria uh, for all of these and by all means have at it. I, I'm not, I don't have the final word here, but if we're going to take an estimate of, four, let's say 400,000 UFO sorties are, uh, you know, occurring per year, we'll just say. So that comes down to a little over a thousand trips per day, right? Uh, and if you take, divide by 3.5, so that's how many trips per day are made. So if, 
each commercial airliner is making about three and a half trips per day, flights per day. So if you did the same numbers with UFOs, if you just did the same numbers with UFOs, you come to a little more than 300 UFO craft that would that could, in theory, be responsible for all of these sightings. I have 313. You know, again, it comes down to what numbers you choose to plug in. Uh, there's very little doubt in my mind that at, at multiple points along this these calculations, I'm sure that I have assumptions that are not correct. So, um, but there you go. Now, uh, what I, I guess I will just, and I'm getting to, ready to wrap this up here. What I think we can, we can state here is that almost certainly, I'm going to say almost definite by any standard, the amount of UFO traffic in our world is significant and is unappreciated by most researchers, because I don't hear anyone talking about this, and it is almost completely ignored just in general. I don't, I don't know of anyone who is really trying to get a handle on this. And when you, when you consider just how potentially significant, gr even grave perhaps, um, certainly important that the UFO phenomenon is to our civilization, you would think we want to start asking some questions about some of these basic facts such as this. It's like if you're uh, you're in a military conflict, you want to know your enemy's order of battle. That's what's the sum total of what they've got to bring to the table here, to bring into the battlefield. How many soldiers, how much equipment, so forth. That's the order of battle. And, you know, it's not that we're at war with these aliens, or maybe we are and we don't know it, or maybe we're not, but it's a challenge if nothing else. They're here. They are not announcing themselves. They are uh, explicitly trying to be clandestine, it seems to me. And that's kind of interesting even of itself, which tells me that they're very calculating. They think tactically and they think strategically. They don't want to be seen. If they're changing their configurations, light configurations, which um, there were a couple of reports that I didn't share with you here where the witness is saying, uh, I watched the conf light configuration change right before my eyes. It went from this configuration to that configuration. It was like, wow, just blew this person's mind. Uh, that's happened many times. So the fact that they're able to do this, I, I think, should be an indication that they think very, uh, they're very calculating about what they are doing. They, these things are not left to chance. So they think this through. And in all likelihood, they're doing this probably for the human witnesses because they don't want, I'm going to think, they don't want the hassle of humans getting in their business unduly. That's my guess. So uh, they certainly are clandestine and secretive about what they are doing. And you would think with something that's that important that we as researchers and as a research community would want to get on top of some of the basic facts as we can understand. What's the basic data? And, you know, for years I've been, I've been <laughs> harping on this theme there's the lack of international cooperation among UFO research groups around the world. Uh, the fact that we don't really do a nearly good enough job at sharing our basic information with each other. Uh, I do want to encourage any, any researcher or any organization in other parts of the world uh, who may hear this, if you have the inclination to start up a database that can allow people to make reports to, please do so. We need more of these. We need much more of these because uh, we're really, we're hamstrung without having some of this basic information and data to work with. I, I am convinced that there are a number of regions in other parts of the world that are definite hot spots of UFO activity. There's no question in my mind. Uh, I am quite convinced that one is at the foothills of the Himalayas in Northern India. I say this because there's just a number of sightings and they all seem to come from the same region uh, in Northern India. And I really would love to be able to get to the bottom of that one. Uh, there are uh, sightings um, 
in um, trying to think of some other regions of the world where these things happen. Well, there's a number of uh, ocean-based sightings that are going to be very difficult for us to get a handle on because to get researchers out there, uh, I am of the opinion that there's much more ocean-based activity than most of us ever recognize. I just recently did a fairly deep dive into USOs for my website and uh, came away just thinking that there's so much activity out in the bodies of water of this planet. And for the most part, we just, we're not aware of it. So we're going to be uh, hamstrung for probably always in trying to get a true handle on this, but we can at least do a, do a little better here. So we want to share data. We want to get a sense of how big this phenomenon is. But I do think no matter how you look at it, it's quite significant. Think about this. Let's say that the estimate of say roughly 300 UFO craft is correct or 350 or something like that. That seems almost low after all of the sightings that, you know, here I am talking about like all these thousands of UFO sightings per year. But if we work on the model of our airline industry, and again, that's another potentially flawed analogy, but like just for the sake of argument, because this, <clears throat> what else do we have to work off of here? <clears throat> if you have one flying saucer craft, that's making three or four trips per day and you work it every single day, well then yes, a, a, a fleet of say 300 or 400 might in theory be responsible for pretty much everything that we're seeing. Now, the thing to keep in mind with that is not all of these craft look the same. Some look like discs, some are, uh, are triangles, black triangles. Um, and some look like glowing orbs that are the size of a basketball. Uh, and, and there's a whole bunch of other shapes out there. These things are really bizarre and they come in a variety of shapes. And the fact that they are able to shape shift frequently is something that we should keep in mind when we are seeing such a variety of shapes. Uh, it is, you know, it's still mystifying in many ways when we try to understand why do these things look the way that they do? Why do they look so strange? Well, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that any more than you do. But uh, for the disc-shaped ones, for the triangle-shaped ones, those are clearly technological. Uh, those clearly have the capability to house beings inside them. And there's certainly a lot of those two types of craft that continue to be reported um, every year. So, you know, I mean, a fleet of 300 of these, could you imagine the reaction of the world if, if people were to find out, yes, there's a fleet of 350 advanced flying saucer aircraft that are being operated by the aliens or by aliens with human collaborators or whatever, uh, that would be a, a fairly significant bombshell. And maybe there's, <laughs> I, I suspect that we have groups within our uh, secrecy structure that do have a handle on some of these questions that I am asking here. But uh, don't expect them any time to volunteer what they know to us. Uh, for all of this talk on disclosure and we're in the new era of UAPs, not UFOs, and now you know we're talking more about this phenomenon than we than we used to do so. All of that is fine, but the fact is we are still at the most rudimentary of baby steps in having an actual adult conversation on this subject in the public realm, where we are just only just getting started, if that. The deeper implications are still never being addressed here. And, and I'm going to leave you with the last implication to think about. What the hell is all of this activity about? What are these craft doing? If you've got a fleet of, of several hundred of these craft and they're making multiple sorties a day or missions per day to do what they do, what are they doing? Well, um, you know, I, I think I talked about this in a re recent YouTube video, or maybe I did it on my website, but basically they're doing a couple of different things. They're sometimes hanging out in the sky, just hovering, and then they zip off. Uh, sometimes they're hovering at 300 feet at three o'clock in the morning above your house or above your next door neighbor's house. Yeah, they do that. That's an interesting thing that I, I've talked about a lot and we need to not forget that. Uh, so those are two things. And, and there are, uh, sometimes they're just seen zipping uh, through the sky very quickly, maybe hover, going from one destination to another really fast. But what are they doing? 
Uh, my own conclusion, at least one thing they are doing in part in a big way, is human abductions. And I believe that when you look at abduction, uh, when you look into abduction phenomena and you try to get a handle of how widespread the UFO abduction phenomenon is, my uh, conclusion at this time is that it's it's fairly widespread and that a large number of people who have had what appear to be an abduction experience, uh, most of them don't talk about it. Most of them actually do not tell. They certainly doesn't go in a report. It doesn't go into anyone's book. Uh, sometimes those people will belong to, uh, there's a few different abduction support groups that are out there in you know various places, but by and large, I think most people, uh, they have these very, very traumatic experiences that happen to them. And it's very difficult, you know, for them to talk about it. It's very difficult. And uh, they just keep it to themselves. And it's, you know, I've, I've, you know, I've talked to some of these people. And, and so is my wife, Tracy. We both look into this. And you see there's a lot of trauma involved with many of these individuals. And I just consider it tragic. But my point here is that it's much more widespread, I think, than most of us are recognizing in our society. There's a lot of this going on. So I, I suspect that a lot of the UFO activity that is perceived uh, has to do with alien abduction. I think a lot of it, not all of it, maybe, but I do think uh, a fairly large amount of it. So these are things that I believe we as a community who are interested in this subject need not to lose sight of. We've got to keep this in our, our vision and we need to keep talking about it. What is going on here? What are these guys doing? Uh, the last thing that we want to do is be guided by the United States Pentagon, frankly, which gave their UAP hearing to Congress a few months ago and gave some of the most lackluster and just lazy answers uh, relating to UFO activity that one can imagine. You know, here's the Pentagon telling Congress that over the last uh, roughly 20 years, they've collected 400 uh, military UFO UAP encounters. And when I heard them say that, I thought, oh, well done, guys. You have nearly as many as I personally have collected for the 21st century of military encounters. I have more than that. And I'm not saying they're all classified and they're all a sure shot. But when I encounter a sighting, for someone who sees an object and then sees a couple of F-18s in the vicinity going after it, I think I consider that a military encounter. And so I've got um, yeah, more than 400. So I have more than the Pentagon had. And there's no way that I should have more than them, right? There's just no way. Uh, and that, of course, that doesn't even speak to the massive number of civilian encounters that just happen from ordinary individuals. So there's a tremendous amount of activity going on here. And we need to talk about this more and more. We need to understand this is a worldwide, uh, very widespread phenomenon that potentially is, there could be half a million UFO trips around the world every year. That would not be, that would not astonish me at all. Frankly, I'll just uh, tell you honestly here, I think the numbers that I came up with are low, not high. I don't think that they're outrageously high. I think they are, if anything, too low. And uh, to be honest with you, I was trying to be careful <laughs> in giving you the numbers that I did. So if you think that they're too high, well then, you know, my apologies, but this is just how I see it. Um, but again, I would encourage any one of you who has the uh, wherewithal, you want to do this, figure this out on your own, come to your own conclusions. And, um, you know, let us all know what you think. This is what I think. So we're dealing with a very widespread, intense phenomenon. And we as a society really need to get a handle on this even much more than we have. We've been in this for almost 80 years, you know, talking about UFOs and flying saucers and the like. And where are we? It's 2022. We are nearly 25% of our way through the new century. And, and we're still not communicating internationally in any significant way relating to this phenomenon. There is no excuse for that. We really need to do better. Well, that's all I've got for you. I want to thank all of you for being here with me. A big thanks to the chat family, super chats, very much appreciated. 
Uh, I always appreciate your support for the research uh, that I do. If you really like what I've got going on here, please like this video, uh, get notifications, all of that, of course, so you don't miss my new videos. Uh, do check out my website, richardolanmembers.com, where uh, we've just, we're giving, it's still getting a new facelift. Um, we've got a lot of new stuff in there and it, it keeps getting better. We've got a great community there, wonderful people uh, over at Richard Olin Members. And that's it. Uh, I'm here every so often. I don't do videos every week, but I do them. I'm still here on a fairly regular basis and I will be back again. And uh, I want to thank you all for your support. And let us please remember, you know, as crazy as our world is, and it is a crazy world, people have gone through difficulties in the past and we can do the same. Let us keep our chin up and let us keep fighting the good fight. Catch you all again later. Thanks for being here with me.